Let's celebrate his love. He is our victory today. We're going to rejoice in that. We'll sing it out together. Hearts rejoice. Oh, hearts rejoice. Breaking silence. You are my God alone. It's time to stand on your word with passion. Heaven's our sing this next song called My Story. It's one of my favorite songs because it reminds me of who I am. You know, who I am is not what I accomplish in life. It's not even my past failures. Can I get an amen on that? But Jesus, when we find our identity in him, he says, you are a child of the living God. And that's who we are. That's our story. Let's be reminded of that today. And let's sing it out as we celebrate that truth. Told you my story, you would hear. 
so good to us, Jesus. We thank you so much for your love this morning and for paying the price that we didn't have to pay, for taking our place, Lord. Your mercy never ends. Your love will never run out on us. And Jesus, we just want to take this time to say thank you to you today. You gave your all, and we want to give it back to you this morning. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. Yes, there is. And there's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where all the Oh 
we owe it all to Jesus. Amen, church. He gave it all for us. We owe it all back to him.
Well, good morning, everyone. And we were going to, we, we thought about passing out t-shirts this Sunday morning. I survived the winter of, and, uh, but glad to have you back. Uh, you say, well, why didn't we do that? Because we didn't know if we were going to get buried this week like the last two Sundays. So those of you that uh, didn't make it the last two Sundays, glad to have you back. We have uh, Grandma South all the way from Kansas City. And uh, where you at, Grandma? There she is right there. Good to have you with us. You might, you might also know her as the candy lady. She used to be a greeter at the door right there. And, and it was when she was the greeter, it was basically the most popular door because she passed out candy all the time. And so she got the moniker, you know, the candy lady. And so Buzz passes out lifesavers over here. So he's getting pretty popular, too. Uh, so the rest of you greeters, you better just up your game, man. That's all, that's all I can tell you. Uh, we've been doing a, a, a series called Life, Money, and Hope. The last two weeks uh, were big snow days, so I hope that you have the ability to go on the Internet and, and kind of catch up because they were so key to understanding this series. The first message we talked about, basically, something that's, that's dear to my heart because numbers make sense to me, and that's just simply financial management and uh, and, and the Bible has a lot to say about financial management and the principles uh, that will, will actually bless our life. But then in that message, we look beyond the numbers to biblical principles that are superior to even those financial principles, things like our calling and contentment, being God-dependent in our life rather than independent in stewardship, which lends itself to the last principle was generosity. Then the second message was Sometimes in life, you can do all the right things, have the right plan, and, and, and actually implementing that plan in your life, but things happen, and sometimes we, we get into a dark place or we get stuck. We feel like we're in a hole. And so whether that's financially or relationally or physically or uh, in your work life, the principles in getting out of that hole are the same no matter, you know, the, the road into it is the same, but also the way out. And that's why we called it the way out. And so if, if you feel stuck, I, I, I encourage you to go on the Internet, grab that, because it will bless your life today. And really this whole series about uh, life and money and hope is, is really to bring again each year to our mind at the beginning of the year that there's a way that seems right to us, the Bible says, but it lead, doesn't lead to success. It leads, the Bible says, to destruction. And, and that's the way we typically tend to go. It, it's, it's very, uh, it, it, if, if, if it was a monster coming down the street at us every day going, I'm gonna, we would recognize it, right, and run the other way. But it doesn't come at us like this. It comes at us sneaky. And, and, and the the. The Bible tells us that Satan uses trickery and he makes it appear like, oh, this is good for me when it's not. And it's very subtle. In, he's very subtle in his tax. And so that way that seems right to us is actually not the way. In fact, this whole series, basically, the mindset is God's way works. God's way works. My way doesn't work. God's way works. And the more I'm living my way, the less success and, and the less fulfillment and purposeful I'm going to live my life. And so the key verse for this whole series is Haggai, chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, where it says, Now, the Lord of hosts, the God of heaven, this is what he says, Think carefully about your ways. Why? Because this series is about how God's way works. He says, so think about your ways. Take assessment. Use these sermons, it's only four sermons, and use them to take an assessment, to do a self-examination and say, is my way God's ways? Or is the rest of this, this verse basically how you understand your life to be? You have planted much but harvest little. You're, you're working hard. You're working hard, but it's not really paying off like you think. You eat, but you, you never... Get satisfied. You're, you, you understand there, you're, you're still this, at emptiness. There's still something missing. You drink. You never have enough to, to become satisfied. You put on clothes. You never have enough to get warm. 
the wage earner, I, I like this last one, he, he puts his wages into a bag, but it feels like it has holes in it. And it's like, man, it seems like I'm not, there's something else missing. And then he says, think carefully about your ways. What is this verse saying? It's God asking us, hey, how's it going? Is your way working? And if you think there's something more, if you think there's something missing, then this series is for you. And that's what we begin today's message with the question, are your efforts paying off or is something missing? We, uh, as Americans, are living in, I, I don't know about you, but I, I live in the greatest country on the planet. Can I get an amen? amen. God bless America, right? I mean, I do. I, I, we have our issues, don't we? We do, but let me tell you, our issues are small compared to other nations' issues. I mean, America is the land of the free, home of the brave. G g give me another amen. Come on. I'm trying to get you fired up here having an American moment, and because you're just born in this country, you're blessed. You're blessed. And I know that there's a lot of people saying, oh, America's broken, it's this, it's that. And let me tell you, just because you were born in this country, you're blessed. You're blessed. Now, if you were born in this country and you're handsome like me, you're doubly blessed. Yes, yes, see? Just want to see if you're listening. Okay, you're, you're like, well, I'll just take America and that's it. But we are blessed. But you know what? We know we're the blessed. We know that we live in a blessed country. But a lot of people will tell you they don't feel like it. They don't feel like it. Now, let me just tell you what the studies say. The studies say that the average American makes $45,000 a year. Okay, and you're like... Man, that ain't much. Well, if you compare it globally, you hear a lot about the top 1%. Well, if you're making $45,000 a year, you're in the top 1% on the whole globe. You're one of the one percenters. And I got to believe everybody in here is a one percenter. You say, oh, no, I'm not. Those one percenters, they, we talk about them on the news all the time. No, you're a one percenter if you look at the whole globe. And what we're talking about in America is where you are within that 1%. <laughs> you see? So we are blessed. We just don't feel like it. We don't feel like it. Now, the Apostle Paul wrote to young Timothy as a pastor, and he said, I want you to deal with the wealth that's in your congregation. And so I'm going to deal today with the wealth that's in our congregation because we're all wealthy people on a global scale. We're all rich people. And here's what he says in 1 Timothy 6. He said, instruct those who are rich in the present age. And that's us. You know, I, I don't feel like it. Well, you might not feel like it, but let's put it this way. You stand in front of a closet that is so jammed with clothes, you sometimes move them elsewhere so you can put other clothes in there, and we stand in front of it and say, I got nothing to wear. <laughs> Come on, everybody. Let's be honest. We're in church. I got nothing to wear. You know what that is? That's a rich person problem. Standing in front of a closet full of clothes, and not having anything to wear. Let me give you another rich person problem, okay? My phone, my internet, and my cable television all runs on the same system, so if my system goes down, I don't have a phone, I don't have cable, and I don't have internet. My life is over as I know it, because all that stuff comes into my house, and we are used to Watching a TV program while I have my iPad and my wife has her tablet and we're talking on the cell phone. And if that goes down, we have to talk to each other. Oh, no. And here's a rich person problem. I have to wait how long for that service man to get here? Between the hours of what and what? And we get mad about having to wait for them to come out and fix our phone Okay, and you say, how did you call the guy? I didn't call him on my landline because that's down. I called him on my cell phone 
Because I have two numbers. What is that? It's a rich person problem. And we all got rich people problems. <laughs> Can I get an amen? amen? We do. Let me tell you a rich person problem I had recently. We were coming back from taking uh, my father-in-law's great-grandson out to see him and bless that 93-year-old to hold that uh, hold little Thomas, and, and it just blessed him. On the way back, uh, on the plane, we made a stop in a city in the south, and they had a winter storm. They got about that much snow right there. <laughs> and we landed, we were taxiing, and they're like, and they come over to the loudspeaker system. Uh, those of you that are going on to Detroit, we, do, we think this plane is grounded, and we're looking outside going, why? We just landed. What's the big problem? Just turn around and, you know, take back off. Oh, no, it's a winter storm. Okay, so that's a, that's a, that's a problem because this was Friday night, and so we go in, and we, we're trying to keep our cool. We've got a little one with us, and, and he was about, I think he was about five weeks old at that time, and, and so he walked up and said, hey, well, when can you get us there? Can you get us out on a flight in the morning? He said, the earliest I can get you there is Saturday night at about 1130. I was like, what? And, and the, the winter storm was up above the southern town. It's actually, it was Nashville, and it was above it. And so we're like, we didn't want to take the chance of getting in a car and driving through the winter storm in cities and, and states that don't know how to salt the roads. Yeah. So we're like, uh-oh. So we're like, well, we're not going to try that, but... Give me an airport south. And they said, well, I, I can get you there by 1 o'clock tomorrow afternoon out of Atlanta. I'm like, okay, so here's a rich person problem. What is it? Well, since it was weather correlated, they wouldn't help us at all. So I went downstairs, rented a car, drove to Atlanta, got in at 2.30 in the morning, hopped in a hotel room, got up the next morning, got on a plane and flew home so we could work Saturday, get ready for church on Sunday and say, man, that was a problem. Yeah, but it was a rich person problem. I didn't think twice about all that. I was like, yeah, car rental, let's go. Hotel, let's go. Why? It's a, car, it, it, it's a rich person problem. We all have rich people problems. When we go into our cabinets and go into our refrigerator and start checking the dates of things and throwing them out, we find out, man, we got a rich person problem. Okay? They're not poor people problems. They're rich people problems. Okay? So let's look at what Paul wrote 2,000 years ago in, to the church of Corinth. Chapter 8, verse 9, he says, You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, and man, Jesus owns it all. He owns the universe. It's all his. It was all rightfully his. When he was on the right hand of the throne of God, it all belonged to him. He's, he's rich. He has no need for anything, yet for our sakes he became poor. He tossed it all aside to become human flesh and die on the cross for us. Can I get an amen? amen? Well, why? So that by his poverty, him becoming human, going to the cross, paying for our sins, he could make you and me rich. Now, the one thing that this world can't take away, the wealth, is knowing God as your Savior. Amen? amen. That, that the world cannot take away. The world can brutalize you, the world can abuse you, debase you, but it cannot unsave you. Can I get an amen? So if you know Christ as your Savior, you're rich for eternity. Why? Well, you already got a mansion being built in heaven. So uh, you see my house here. Doesn't matter. This house here, no matter how grand, no matter how pitiful, it's going to burn up. But the one there is forever. Can I get an amen? I'm trying to preach to some Christians today. I just want to know if I got any no God people in this room. Okay, talk to me a little bit. It's okay. I've been kind of bottled up with the snow, so I'm ready to go. So you're already rich for all eternity if you know God, but he doesn't, he's not just talking about then. He wants to make us wealthy now. You say, oh, here we go. I just knew it was going to be a moment to... So Pastor Tom turned, out, turned into a prosperity preacher. <laughs> now, why does Scripture say that Jesus became poor so he could make us rich? Well, I'm glad you asked that because he answers it in the next chapter, 2 Corinthians 9-11. He says, you will be enriched, rich, 
in every way for all generosity, which produces thanksgiving to God through us. He makes us rich. See, prosperity gospel says this. He makes you wealthy so you can be wealthy. I don't believe that. We don't preach that. We don't believe that. We believe that God makes us rich so we can be a blessing to others. That's what he gives us more so we can influence and be a blessing to other people. Now, as a church, I never, you, when, when you hear me pray at the offering at times like that, when we're talking about resources, I don't pray, Lord, just give us what we need. I say, Lord, give us above what we need. Trust us with beyond what we need so we can what? So we can bless others and grow the influence of your name in this place and through this place. We don't ask for more than we need so we can have more. We ask for more than what we need so we can have more of an impact, so we can send it out and impact the kingdom. But let me tell you, the church that's not impacting the kingdom, the church that doesn't have enough to meet their obligations here. Doesn't that make sense? I mean, if I don't have enough to meet my obligations, I can't be a blessing to somebody else. I have to have more than that. And so God blesses us with more so we can bless others with it individually and as a church. Now, here's the problem, though. The problem is, in America, even Christians in America, we're not very good at being rich. Okay, that's last year. We actually, I actually preached a sermon, a series, a, a short series taken from Andy Stanley's book on how to be rich because he's dealing with the fact that God, if you're blessed in this country, if you're born in this country, you, you are one of the world rich people. And we're not good at it because why? Because the more Americans make, the less they give away percentage-wise. You would think it'd be opposite. The more we wait, well, I don't, I don't need that, so I, I did without it before, so this is the more I can give. But no, we, we increased, what is it called? The standard of living. We start climbing up the ladder. We do the ladder climb. And that's how we measure success. But the Bible says, no, Jesus measures it by emptying himself so others could become rich. Hmm. So 1 Timothy, let's go back to that key verse where Paul tells young Pastor Timothy, instruct those who are rich, that's us, in this present age not to be arrogant and definitely don't hope in the uncertainty of wealth, but instead on God, who richly provides us with all things to enjoy. Oh, I want you to underline that. He has given you things to enjoy. Can I get an amen? That's, I mean, I might as well just pray and say, you know, God bless you, have a, because you're going to go enjoy lunch. And why did God do that? Because he wants you to enjoy lunch. Solomon writes in Proverbs, he says, it is a blessing from God for a man to enjoy his work and enjoy the fruit of his labor. It's a blessing from God. Okay? He wants us to enjoy. So he says, we shouldn't feel bad. He doesn't want you feeling guilty. He wants to instruct us to do what is good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, willing to share. I'm, I'm, I want to, in the, in the last few years in America, there's been a theology that has, has really like, like gained some momentum, and it's, it's known as aesthetic theology or the theology of aestheticism. And, and what that means is that God wants us, that there is a holiness that comes from suffering and being poor and being destitute. And Paul didn't believe that because Paul says God gives us things to enjoy so that we can bless others too. And so it's not an accurate theology. We do not practice that theology nor teach that theology. In fact, those that are rich should help alleviate the suffering of the poor. If it were not true, then if aesthetic theology is true, when you see someone suffering, don't help them say, man, you're getting holy, brother. And he's like, forget the holiness, give me a sandwich, man. Right? Yeah. And so 
we don't believe that theology, but what God doesn't want us to do, and this is what churches fall into the trap of, and you'll, you'll not see me do this. We, we work hard at not doing it. I try to give you the principle behind it rather than tugging on your heartstrings because guilt giving is temporary. So I can put together a video. I can get images from uh, the Philippines, South America, Central America, Asia, Africa. I mean, anywhere in the world, I can get images of little children sitting in squalor, uh, children picking things out of the trash dump and so on and so forth, and just pull on your heartstrings and say, man, if you don't give 20 bucks a day, you just don't know God. Okay? And it works temporarily, but it doesn't change anybody's heart. That's a work of God. And so we don't do that. We, we talk in rational means because we're rational beings. And that's what the verse said in Haggai. He said, let's think carefully about this. Put some thought into this. What should I use my resources for? So is it just about getting more for me and therefore getting happier? Because he wrote this 2,000 years ago and he said, it's not going to work. It's going to feel like putting your stuff in a bag and it's leaking out. It's leaking out. So what will actually get me there? Well, as, as simple as it is, the first thing that will bring this satisfaction to your life is known as tithing. It's tithing. It's giving the first fruits of your labor to the Lord. You don't give it to the church. You give it through the church to Jesus. If, it, if you were just giving to the church, I'm going to quit tithing because I'm on the receiving end. My paycheck comes from the church. But I tithe too. Because why? I'm not giving to the church. I'm giving to God. But since I belong here, this is where I give my tithe. Because this is my church. And if you're a member, this is your church. And he says, nothing in life will line up until you do that. And so as we tithe, and if, we, if one year as a congregation, everybody practices that, we would have so much left over. We would stop talking about missions, giving, special projects. We would if everybody just did the basic. But let's say you're one of those people like me. You do the basic, and you want more. God has given you more because he's blessed you, and he's given you more margin, and you can do more of that. Then you step into this, random acts of kindness. And we have these cards in the lobby, and, and what this card says is something extra to show you that God loves you. And we ask you to take these cards, because tithing is what we do corporately, but this is what you can do individually to affect your culture. And, when you're, and we've given you several suggestions on the website when you're in line in the fast food or at the coffee shop, or, you know, it's, it's, it's been a, there was a bad snow day, and you go into the office the next day, and you stop at Krispy Kreme. Can I get an amen, everybody? And you bring Krispy Kremes to work. Don't just set the Krispy Kremes there. Set a stack of cards there and say, I did this because God loves you, to your coworkers. You might not even like some of those coworkers. Chances are you don't, and for good reason. But God loves them. Come on, everybody. He loves them. And so this is something that you can think about. You can start looking for daily. So as a church, if we take care of tithing, we take care of the needs of, and we can start looking outside ourselves. And we can do that with random acts of kindness. Then we do it through local missions giving. How do we do that as a church? We, two days a week, we bring complete strangers into our lobby of church and we give them food. With the hopes of, of a conversation about God. We don't just give them food and say, hey, get out of here. We give them food and say, hey, listen, God loves you. We give them information about the church, and we try to engage them, if they're willing, into a gospel conversation. We try to pray with them. We ask God to bless them. Why? We're reaching out to people that are needy in our community because, why? it's our mission field. Could they get an amen, everybody? Amen. Well, that, those groceries we pass out, they cost money. And your missions giving goes to that. The fall festival that we throw and invite the community, the Christmas party for a local Christmas, for a local uh, public school. When we do vacation Bible school, we invite the whole community out. Why? Why do we do all that? That's part of our local missions to reach our world with Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And so when you give the missions above your tithe, it goes to fund those things. 
Now, how about our nation? Because the Bible says that we are to be concerned about our nation. And we do that through planting churches and helping those that are planting churches. We're, we're a key helper with a, a church, a life church down in Orlando, Florida. Brant Leach, he used to be the music pastor here. And uh, him and Stacy, his wife, they went down. They just celebrated their year anniversary last year. And they called me Sunday morning and said, Pastor, man, we're so excited. And, and Gilead helped make this happen. And we sent a team down uh, in the summer. We're going to send another team down there. Because why? Because we believe part of the overflow of God's blessing in our life should be to bless others. To bless others. I'm never going to get a tithe check from one of those people in Orlando. So why do we do it? Because it's the gospel mission. Not just here, but other places too. Other places too. And then we have foreign missions. Right now we have a member of our church, Ellie Sagan, say he's, you sent him to the Philippines. And last week they did a medical missions where people lined up to get basic uh, you know, health Things done to them, shots and antibiotics and, and simple things like circumcisions. And we provide that. We provide that. We did a, a, a children's camp a week ago in the Philippines. You provided that. And so you fed those kids and they came out because it was, a, it was an activity and they got the gospel. And kids got saved because of that. Because why? I don't know if I'll ever meet any of those people here on this side of heaven but I'll meet them in glory. Amen? Amen? And they'll say, thank you very much, Gilead. Because you gave, we got saved. Amen. Okay? But those things happen as an outflow of God's blessing us. And so we do this through national pastors and through other ministries. And I also encourage each and every church member here to take a vacation, decide the year, and instead of going on a vacation that year, go on a short-term mission trip and see how the other 99% live on this planet. Because you, you, can, you can listen to me talk about it, that you're rich, but you won't believe it until you go see it and smell it. And when you see it and smell it, you'll come home and you'll say, man, we're rich. We have rich people problems. You will. The next thing is the Christmas offering. We do this every year. We take a special offering at Easter and Christmas, and usually it goes to needs here. But wouldn't it be great if leading up to Christmas, the season of giving, if this coming year we could say, okay, we're sending a group down to Guatemala to Hope of Life, and we've made plans all year, and this year what we're going to do, we're going to build a house for a family down there. We're going to dig a well, and we're going to throw on a VBS in Guatemala with people from this church. What does that take? It's going to take about $20,000. Besides all the money that the people are going to spend personally to get down there, it'd be fun to do something like that, but if we're behind on our budget, we won't do that. So we have to be strategically faithful so that we can really get to the fun stuff. I've painted an accurate picture, isn't it? Yeah. You see, most churches never get to the fun stuff because they're trying to survive. And that tells the world that our God is poor and he can't take care of us. I don't know about you. I don't like saying that about our God. Do you like saying that about our God? No, I don't. I like saying our God has everything we need and then some. Come on, amen. Amen. Now, as I mention these things, notice I started out by saying, I don't like when you get guilted, because I don't guilt. I'm not like, if you don't, then those children are... Uh, no, I'm not doing that. And I'll stand up and browbeat. These are just opportunities for you to get involved in growing the kingdom through your local church. Now, I believe in no pressure giving. Because when somebody pressures me, I walk the other way. I don't like it. So if I don't like it, I figure you don't like it. When I'm walking in the store and somebody shoves a survey in my face, hey, would you sign this? It's about this. I'm like, man, I don't have, you can't explain it to me. 
and I don't trust you and I don't know you and stop pressuring me because you know I want you out of my way so I can go into the store. I don't like they say you don't sign them. Never. Never. Because why? It's pressure. I don't like pressure sales tactics. It backfires. When you pressure, if you're a salesperson in here, you pressure me, I'm out the door. Because let me tell you, Cindy and I always pray on it overnight. And salesmen are taught, don't let them get away. So we tell, we tell salesmen all the time, listen, we're going to go home, we're going to pray about it. And they're like, oh, man, I got to get you to sign. And they sweeten the deal. We're like, no, seriously, I don't care how you sweeten it. We're not signing right now. We're going to go home, sit on it overnight and pray about it. And they think, oh, you'll never show. And then they tell you that here's the bottom line. This won't be available tomorrow. <laughs> Come on. That's like the first 25 callers. And you've seen that commercial for three years. They're not the 25 yet? What? How do they afford that TV time? Come on, put on your thinking cap. Pressure. So I don't want to pressure you. So let me read about one of the two most successful offerings ever taken. One was the one I'm going to reference here, taken when they were putting together the material for the building of the tabernacle as the children of Israel had left Egypt and they were on their way to the promised land. And the other one was when David took the offering to get together all the stuff to build the temple. And in both offerings, ready? In both offerings, people gave so much, they had to send the word out, stop bringing stuff. We, 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 we can't handle any more stuff. Stop bringing it. Stop bringing it. Never said by a Baptist pastor in the history <laughs> of giving. Right? Or any other pastor. Okay, but it did happen. It's right here in Scripture. Exodus 35. Verse 5, and here's, here's Moses talking, He's, it, and the Lord is instructing Moses. He said, take a sacred offering for the Lord. Let those who know they better, no, it doesn't say that, who know if, they're, if they don't, no. Let those with generous hearts present the following gifts to the Lord, gold, silver, and bronze. He said, let those that, are, that have a heart to do it. Look what he says in chapter 21. All whose hearts were stirred and those whose spirits were moved came and brought their sacred offerings to the Lord. They brought all the materials needed for the tabernacle, for the performance of his rituals, and for the sacred garments. Both men and women came, all whose hearts were willing. They brought all their personal jewelry and, and, and to fund this. These were items that were precious to them. And they said, no, no, this is, this is going to be a forever testimony for God. And that's what happens when we intentionally are generous in ministry giving. We change eternity for people's life. And that treasure can never be taken away from us. Never. It's the best investing that we do. So notice I said it's intentional. It's based on your heart. And there's a principle that comes with this that's found in 2 Corinthians 9. And it depends on how you want to experience life. And, he's, and the Apostle Paul, and we read some verses earlier in the same passage, he said, remember this. There's an overall general principle. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. If, if you sow a, just a little pot of ground, you're, it, it's going to grow, but it's, it's not going to be the harvest like if you sowed a whole field. It, it makes sense. We understand that. Farmers get it. We get that. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. So it's tied in with how much we trust the Lord. And each of you, notice this though, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Underline that. What you don't let somebody guilt you into it. Don't let somebody force you into it because I believe when you allow that to happen, you and I forfeit our blessing. You heard me. I think we forfeit our blessing because we're giving to get that pressure off. We're not giving unto the Lord. There's a difference. And man, sometimes little things will so annoy me, I'll do anything to make them stop. Right? 
Exactly. And so he says, as you have determined in your heart, notice this, not reluctantly. If you're like, oh, I'm kind of on the fence about this, then don't give. He doesn't, he doesn't bless reluctant givers. I'm giving, what are the people down the road going to think about me? Reluctance, forget about it. Don't worry about it. God will take care of it. Or under compulsion, there's the guilt giving. Because why? God loves cheerful givers. The word for cheerful there is the word that we get, the root word for hilarious. He loves givers that are like, oh, man, <laughs> I'm like, yeah. You're like, man, I haven't given like that in a long time. Maybe we need a little bit more joy in our giving. I think most people approach this subject from the wrong angle, and we dismiss our blessing because we're giving out of guilt, we're giving out of have to. We're get, instead of giving from our heart, we're like, yeah, I get to do this so that God, and I can't wait to see what he does through this and to me. Yeah. Because when he can trust you with more, and he sees you don't hoard it, but instead you put it to use, he'll give you more. Like the farmer, the more seeds you plant, the more harvest you gather. And when you gather a bigger harvest, you can't eat but so much. So what do you do with all that? You just plant more. See? You just plant more. So how do I decide? Notice what it says. Each of you should give what you have decided. How do I decide? That's <laughs> the key thrust of this message. How do I decide? How do I choose? What filters do I use? Whether to give or not give. Whether to live with margin and what should I do with that margin? I'm glad you asked that question because I'm going to answer it right now. First of all, I think you should decide based upon these three filters. The first filter is the relationship question. Who will I commit to relationally? I believe that God uses relationships that he has you in certain places at a certain time to be in relationship with a certain group of people to impact the kingdom. I don't think it's an accident that you're here. I don't think it's an accident that you are in the family that you're in, that you were born into the family you were born into. I think that's all by God's design for relationships. I don't think it's an accident you're in the small group you're in. I don't think it's an accident that you're in this geographic area and you're born at this particular time in history. Those are all planned by a sovereign, providential God. Can I get an amen? amen. There are no accidents in your life. Here's one thing God's never going to do. Wow, I didn't see that coming. Never going to say that. Never going to say that. You're, we're never going to surprise him. He's never going to say, ooh, I should have planned for that. Never. Because why? He knows all things. And all of time is now to him. And I know that makes our circuits kind of go, <laughs> but it, that's who God is. His ways and his thoughts are above ours. And so he puts us in these key relationships so we can commit to one another. I am in a covenant relationship with you in this church because I chose of my own free will to become a member of this church. I chose a covenant relationship with you. And I said, I will labor together with you for the kingdom of God in this place. And so that's why I give my, Cindy and I give our tithe here, we give our resources here, and we give our energy here. Why? Because we are in covenant relationship with you. You're my family of God. You're my covenant relationship brothers and sisters in Christ. Hope you like me. Because you're stuck with me forever. You're like, well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to not live around you. Oh, I think you're going to be surprised about that. Because I might be right around the corner. You're like, I'm going to make a special request, Lord. It'll probably cost you a double tide to get away from me in heaven. Okay? So we are in relationship. I think you should give where your relationships are. Second filter is the difference question. When I give, will it make a difference? Eternally. I think to feed people without giving them the gospel is not justice. I think it's unjust. Because to feed them and not showing them that that resource comes from an almighty God that gave his son to die for them is not giving them what they need forever. 
We have to tie in our good works with the good news. Amen? Amen. And so will it make a difference eternally? So here's what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians. If anyone builds on the foundation that we have in Christ, this is our life's work with gold, silver, costly stones. Notice the difference in these building materials or wood, hay, or straw. Each one's work will become obvious. Can you build a home with gold, silver, and stones? Yes, because the Lord says that's what he's building our home with in heaven, so it must be true. But can you build it with wood, hay, and straw? Yeah, basically our houses are built out of that. And where cement come from, it's the ground. You know, rocks and ground and a little, you know, mixture and the wood, that's the two by fours. And basically all of our house here, it comes with temporary materials, but they don't last forever, do they? We walk into houses and we go, well, it's a little dated. <laughs> right? Some of you got, you know, the gold, everything. Well, guess what? Gold's coming back. <laughs> you don't have to replace that gold, those gold faucets. They're hip again, all right? Just clean them up, shine them. You're like, oh, yeah, we're, we're hip. You'll be hip for about five more years. Those of you sitting upstairs in the balcony, look at the color of your pew. It's green. And when I went to church here, these walls were yellow striped wall paper. They were hideous. But it was hip in the 70s, right along with pantsuits and polyester leisure suits. Remember those? Some of you don't even know. You're going to have to Google it because laser suits were the worst thing ever made by the fashion industry. Yeah. I'll take a man bun over a leisure suit. Can I get an amen? Sorry, if you got to have a man bun, I'm sorry. I know it's your last day in church. I love you still. Love you still. I just got in trouble. I was doing fine. Got in trouble. So we can build our house out of different things, our life's work. But each one of our work will become obvious because the day, there's going to come a day, it's going to be disclosed, whether it will, because it's going to be revealed, it's going to be tested by fire. And the fire will test the quality of each one of our life's work. And so here's the test. If anyone's work that he has built survives, he will receive a reward. What that means is if you have built a work that survives, that's eternal, you get, you get rewarded. If you look beyond now to eternity, you get rewarded for that. Every thought, every morsel, every, every single effort, you get rewarded for that. Because why? It's made an eternal difference. But if we just live for now, if anyone's work is burned up, temporary, the thing's of this world that I don't care how great it is, it's going to be burned up one day, you will be lost. You'll still be saved, yet it will be like an escape through fire. So will I make an eternal difference? If we are making a difference for eternity, let's give our all, right? If it's only a temporary thing, it's not worthy. It's, it's a filter. So it's the relationship. It's an eternal difference. The third filter question is the God question. And I think this is the most exciting one. Is God speaking to me about it? And I think this is the most important one. It's the most missed one. But it's the most enjoyable one. Is God speaking to me about it? Let's say you leave today and, and, and there's going to be these make a difference cards. Um, because God loves you at every door when you leave. Let's say you grab a handful of them, and this week you're in that line. And instead of just in that line going, I wonder how long it's going to take, and, and what am I going to order? You know what you're going to order. That's why you're in that line. You're not looking at the menu going, oh, has the chef made any differences in the menu at Taco Bell lately? <laughs> yeah, they got new fries. Deal with it. Order and move. Okay? I mean, we pretty much know what we, when you get in that line, you know what you're going to get. But... It would change it if you were in that line going, God, is this a moment where you are going to use me to touch somebody's life? 
And when you walk into the coffee shop, is this the moment, God? Are you, is there somebody in here you want me to interact with? It changes going into the coffee shop. It changes going into the fast food line. When, when you walk into work, instead of thinking already from the parking lot into the building, when you're already thinking all the way there about all the stuff you've got to do and what you're going to attack first and this, if you're, if you're instead thinking, God, is there somebody in here you want me to touch today? You want me to be a blessing to today? Show me how. Show me how. Is there somebody in my neighborhood that needs me to get them a cake just to let them know? God, are you speaking that to me? And when, on a daily basis, when we find out, when we give room for God to start breathing his life into us, just think how that will change the mundaneness of our life. Is God speaking to me today? Or have we learned to turn him off? Because we're in a hole. Well, you need to listen to last week's message. Get out of the hole so God can start using you every single day. Matthew 9 says this about Jesus. And Jesus went to all the towns and villages. Look what he did. Teaching in their synagogues. He told them the truth. Preaching the good news. He showed them the way of salvation. And healing every disease and every sickness. So notice his order. He taught, he preached, and he healed. And boy, he had everybody's attention. Can I get an amen? Amen. Well, then what? So when he saw the crowds, when when the crowds came out, when they heard, he felt compassion for them because they were weary and worn out like sheep without a shepherd. You ever look in that coffee shop? You ever look in that, that, that fast food restaurant, that office I mean, and you're like, oh, yeah, I work with those people. They're just the ugliest people. Do you realize how miserable their life must be in order to be that ugly at work? Man, nothing but just toxin spews out of them. How toxic must their life be for every sentence to come out of their mouth just be ugliness? Where's our compassion? We know the truth. Heaven is our home. We're the rich people. We're the ones that can tell them, listen, listen, I know it's bad, but man, Jesus has a better way for you. But we'll never do that if we're not listening to the Savior. We got to let him move in our heart. This whole giving thing, it's all a heart issue. It's not a wallet issue. It's a heart thing. And when God has a heart, he has all of us. He has all of us. And man, we need to start looking at the world like sheep without a shepherd and feel that Jesus' compassion for them and start giving him God opportunity to speak into our life to bless those lost sheep that we are surrounded by. Surrounded by. Just lost. And they don't even know they're lost. They don't even know. And we do. Because why? We're rich. We're blessed. And we can do something about it. We can do something about it. This is the fun part. We can. We can listen to God about tithing. We can listen to him about missions. We can listen to him about random acts of kindness. And we can bless people and change their eternity. And just think how exciting life would get. Just think about that. And every day would be like, oh, man, what, what, are, what, are, what are we doing today, God? When you realize that you are a chosen ambassador and he has a plan for you to touch people, today, it, it changes today. It's like, wow, I, yeah, I didn't, well, he uses other people. No, he uses people like you. Because we're all the same. There's not other people. If you know God, he wants to use you. So in conclusion today, Can we ask the question, Lord, what would you have me do? What do you want me to do? That's a good question, amen, church? That's a good question. I I know you're listening because you're like, wow, that could be me. Yes, it is you. And that can be us. It can be us. But I want to ask everybody, bow your heads, close your eyes, and, and maybe God's speaking to you about this today. Maybe what he's speaking to you about 
It's the fact that maybe you're not one of the rich people. Maybe you're not one of the blessed people because you don't know him. But today you've heard enough about him, that he loves you, that he gave his son's life to die for you, to pay for all your sin. And if you would like to today surrender your life to him and allow him and ask him to forgive you, Today, you can be a rich person, too, for eternity. But you have to know God. And if that's your choice today, if, that's, if, if you've heard that loud and clear and you know God is calling on your heart, and I'm not telling you, oh, if you leave here, you, no, no, you can, you can do it later, but, man, you can do it right now. Why wait? Be bold. Make a decision right now and say, Jesus, I give you my life. And I'm going, to, I'm going to pray in just a moment, but if you would like me to include you in that prayer, and you're humbling yourself, you're saying, man, I need, you've never done this before. I, I'm giving my lo- ownership of my life to Jesus. I, I, I'm going to ask him for forgiveness. I, I believe he died for me. I, I'm going to ask him to take ownership of my life. If that's your prayer today, right before I pray, would you slip your hand up and say, Pastor, you include me in that prayer? Yes, be bold. Yes, be bold. Yes, awesome. Awesome. Anybody else? Yes, upstairs. Awesome. Anybody else? Awesome. Great. Now, how about this? You know you're a believer? Say, no, I, I know I'm saved. I've, I've surrendered my life to God, but man, I just, it's been a long time since I've heard, and today I heard from him. I heard from him while I was sitting here, and I, I know my heart needs to be tender. I need to open up my ears to his voice. I know they're clogged with the thinking and the ways of this world. My way's not working, and I want God to use me greater this week. If that's your prayer, just slip your hand up. I want him to use me greater, hands all over. Let's pray together. Father God, Lord, you saw these hands, but Lord, you see our hearts. Lord, I just thank you for the privilege and opportunity to proclaim the goodness of who you are and the privilege of knowing you and the privilege of having my, my whole future set and nothing and no one, even the enemy, the arch enemy, Satan, he cannot do a thing about it. Thank you for dying for us. Lord, there's people in this room and today they're asking you to come into their life, forgive them of their sins. Lord, they are surrendering their all, their very heart and being to you today. Thank you for accepting them and making them your children. Lord, those of us that are already our, your children and sometimes we just have a tendency to get stale. Lord, bring a freshness to our life. Open up our ears to hear your voice so you can use us greatly to impact others for eternity this week. We pray in Jesus' holy name. If you pray with me, church, say amen. Oh, at the cross, at the cross, I surrender.